I was asked by Tony Robbins, why in the world, what are you using, Rex, to get your results? We were having dinner. I go, I use the Bible. And he goes, you do what? I go, I use the Bible. Why? Because good ideas may come to pass, but God ideas have to come to pass. Good ideas come from the mind of a man. They produce good results. But God ideas come from the word of God, and they produce God results. I don't know about you. I don't need good results in my family. I need God results. Come on, as a parent, as a business owner, as a minister, as a human being, I need God just to get beyond the 805 freeway. Come on, how many have a middle finger that sometimes wants to go up, even if you did pray in tongues the day before? <laughs> Tell yourself the truth. John chapter 5, it's on the right-hand side of the Bible if you have one. If not, I think we'll go, if we can put it up, John chapter 5, and I'm going to read a couple verses, and you're gonna, we're going to explode into this thing today. It says this, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. Someone say a party. Say it like you got energy, C3 East. Come on, a party, all right. Yeah, don't let, don't let no fortune company with thousands of people out shout you. Come on, you got God inside you. Now there's in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew, this is a tongue twister, Beth Ezda. It means house of grace or the place that grace and favor pour out of. In this pool lays a great number of people. They're sick, they're blind, they're lame, and they're paralyzed, but they were all waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel would go down at a certain time, someone say a time, into the pool and stir up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease they had. There was a certain dude there who'd been there a long time, 38 years. Someone say a long time. Say it like you mean it, a long time. That's triente ocho for you Hispanic people, come on. When Jesus saw him lying there, knowing he'd been there for that long, says, yo, do you want to be made well? It's the ghetto translation. Do you want to be made well? And the sick man goes, sir, I got no man to put me into that pool when that water's all stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone else steps down before me. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Someone say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Verse 9, immediately the man became well, or one translation says, he recovered strength. Touch the person next to you, say, you're going to recover strength. He took up the bed he'd been laying on, and he began to move. And that day was the Sabbath day. You're not going to like this. You're going to love this. Watch this. This scripture talks about there's a feast. It's a time of elation and a time of celebration. People would come. They believe it's one of the major three times of the year they'd have these big feasts, and God would have this set up these rituals of feasts so they could remember all God's abundance, all God's goodness. And I believe the celebration is to be our lives. But the reality is most of us aren't celebrating our lives because we're exhausted by life. We're exhausted by, watch, regret, because we believe in our culture where we're taught to be, watch, we're, we're in a therapy culture that teaches us our past equals our future. Come on, somebody. That history equals destiny. I, let me say this. Your history does not equal your destiny, but your psychology does. The scripture says, as a man thinks today, so his life will become tomorrow. At any moment throughout today, you have the opportunity to think a new thought. Come on, somebody. Come on, I encourage you to lean in. Opportunity today is built on your accessibility. If all you do is listen to me, statistics will say you'll remember only less than 8% in a month. That's cheating yourself this morning. You got your butt here. Let's go for it, okay? I'm going to go for it myself because I'm going to speak to myself. If you take notes, you'll retain 38%. But if you engage, you'll retain 94%. Let it be a moment. Don't put up the do not disturb side. Come on, no vacancy. Be accessible. Watch. A lot of people feel that I'm caught in my past. Come on. They nurse it, they curse it, and rehearse it. Why? Because not setbacks somebody else caused, but the ones that we cause, they produce a sense of shame in our eyes. And I don't know if you've been like that. I've had it happen. When your own choice creates your challenge, how you become your worst critic. You don't even need the devil anymore to mess with you because you destroy yourself. 
Solomon said it this way, that oppression begins to unravel your reasoning or you don't consider destiny anymore. You're just trying to survive your history. But you're never going to be good in God trying to fix the old. God did not create you to go through recovery. He wants you to go through discovery. Come on, somebody. Why? Because your discovery will heal your recovery. Come on, smile. Even if you got four teeth, try it. Remember your baby pictures you were happy just because? Come on, used to chase the ice cream truck with no money. Come on, somebody. Do, 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 do. Come on. I want a big stick. How much? 50 cents. I only got 35. Come on, somebody. You were still happy. When you came out of your mother's womb, you came out with a shout. If you didn't, that doctor spanked your booty to make sure you had a shout in you. But watch what happens. Life wants to reduce your shout to a whisper. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm tired. How old are you? I'm 16. You're 16 and you're tired? Give me a Starbucks. It's my third one. I need another Frappuccino. Why? Because I'm tired. Watch people. They've been hit by life. Watch. And they feel like I can't get out. I'm stuck in a moment that I can't get out of. The good news is, come on, the past may well explain why you're suffering, but watch, God gives you a new opportunity where you can sign the death certificate on your then so you can live in your now. You don't got to live on the history channel anymore. Someone in here is about to break into the discovery channel. Whew, why? Why, until you bury it, you'll always give the opportunity for the enemy to come back. The only hold the enemy has on your life is who you used to be. Did you just catch that? Why? Because so many of the people that are in this room right now are misdiagnosing yourself. If you misdiagnose yourself, you mistreat yourself. And if you put yourself on the discount rack, you'll start giving yourself and other people discounts to you. Why? Because if you don't value yourself, you're not going to add value to yourself. You'll always be trying like a cat with gum on the tail, trying to fix the past. What I love about Christianity, what I love about Jesus, I don't want to say Christianity because there's a lot of Christianity, I'm not even sure it's about Jesus. I know a lot of people that are more into being a Christian than they are about being into Jesus. They can tell me about a bumper sticker and Christian singers, but they can't tell me, or a preacher, but they can't tell me what the blood of Jesus did for them. You feel me? I know it's early. Come on. I've had two red-eye flights in 72 hours. I feel you. Let your spirit talk louder than your head. Come on. Watch. Other people aren't enjoying it because, watch, they've been hurt by other people, been trade, stabbed in the back. Come on. Twisted the knife. Somebody lied about you. Now you inventory all the wrong been done to you. Come on. You've been a victimized by them. Come on. Not a victim of them, a victimization of them. And you get stuck in a spirit of grief. There's one thing about grieving the past, a broken relationship, losing money, going through something. But be careful not to get caught in the gloom of grief. It'll paralyze your spirit so you can't see the future. Other people just get caught in the usual the routines of life. Dick Fosbury, 1967, everybody always used to jump feet first to go over the high jump. But he said, we can only go so high at some level. He said, I got to try something different. They go, what do you mean? They said, don't even try to consider doing something different. But he says, if we don't do something different, we're not going to reach new pinnacles. So if you do what you've always done, the adage is you're going to get what you've always got. Come on. Isn't that what they say in AA is called insanity, doing the same thing, expecting something different? Your similarity might create comfort, but it's your different that will create your rewards. Let me just do a tweetable moment for you right now. Your similarity to me in life and doing things, because we're creatures of habit. We go to the same restaurants, have the same conversations. Come on. Wear the same clothes. Come on, somebody. We say the same prayers. I wonder if God's like, yo, you got any new material for me? Can you say something that has some faith in it? Or rather just pray the Lord, hallelujah, pray the Lord, hallelujah. What the, what are you talking about? The angels are like, oh my gosh, they're on autopilot. He made a small shift. It made a massive difference. He said, I'm going to jump head first. They said you can't do it. Be careful that you don't let blind people proofread your vision. Oh, that is good. Come on. That is good. 
Why? Because I know what it's like to give my pearls before swine. I know what it's like to share my dreams with people that are impaired in their vision because all they see is who you used to be. They want to relate to you based on who you were back then. Come on. Jesus could not perform miracles as the son of God in his own hometown because they were only comfortable with him being a carpenter, not the Messiah. Not everybody's going to get the new you. Why? Because they knew you as the one in debt. Why? They don't know you as the God that's going to about to prosper your business and prosper your life. Whew. Anybody feel this in here? Why? Because when you're going through hurting, you get around other hurting people. I want to challenge you. Get around people that are stronger than you. If you walk with wise people, the proverb says you become wiser and stronger. There's a shock in the Hebrew language. It means the, the rubbing off of. If I get around people, I want to get around people that eat well because then I want to eat well. Come on, somebody. I want to get around people that are super happy even when things aren't going good because then that happiness jumps on you. Come on, somebody. You get around negative people, come on, you get negative. And a negative mind ain't going to produce a positive life. That's right. That's right. I'm going to buy my own CD. This is good. Do we still have CDs, Michael? I'm not even sure. Jesus showed up at the celebration of life. Jesus came from a happy place. Something my wife would tell you, I read the Gospels over and 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 over. And I always read it out loud because faith comes by hearing God's word. Your mind, on the right-hand side of your front lobe, will create a picture of the words you constantly speak. Don't read the Bible silent. Read it out loud. You'll find more retention and more activation in your life rather than just doing religious duty. Come on, somebody. It's not how much you digest, it's how much, come on, not how much you just get in, it's how much you make work for you. But I read all over it. Watch Jesus. He's at Lazarus' house. Let's throw a party. Come on, somebody. I'm going to go to Cousin Peter's house. Let's have a party. Isn't it interesting? God takes shaky people like all the disciples and calls them to a sturdy project. Jesus never told Peter to quit cussing. He never told Judas to quit stealing. Come on, somebody. He never told crybaby John in Spanish to stop being a chion. Come on, somebody. But Jesus was always having a party. Let's go to your house, Zacchaeus. Let's throw a party. Come on. Let's go, Lazarus. We're going to hang out and have Thanksgiving at your crib. Come on, somebody. Let's have a, let's have a party. Jesus meant to always celebrate life. To celebrate, celebrate means to make an event out of. To do something where you enjoy. The word enjoy means you bring joy to something, not get joy from something. Could a little shift in our perspective transform your mentality and your experience from being one that's a prison to one that's a passport to pleasure? What do you mean by that? Did you come here today looking to get joy or coming to give joy? Oh, so you mean that God doesn't determine your experience? No, because he meets you at your level of expectation. According to your expectation, be unto you. Some people walked in here, I just want a little, so you get a little. Some people came in today, go, I'm going to light somebody up when they come to church. I'm going to flip and heal somebody. I'm going to encourage somebody. I'm going to give something to God. I'm going to worship him even if I feel like hell. I'm going to give him some thanks for being nice to me. In fact, if you're breathing, it's evidence God still has your best day in front of you. You haven't lived it yet. God's not doing reruns. Come on, somebody. He's not living in syndication. Whew. Watch. To make an event out of how do, how do you really enjoy and celebrate? Because Jesus said in John 16, 22, let no man take your joy. In other words, only you can give it away. How do you give it away? Through complaining and blaming. Come on, somebody. Blaming events, people, yourself, come on. Blaming brings bondage. But you only complain about something you could do something about. Did anybody complain about gravity this morning? <laughs> anybody cuss out gravity on the way to church? No, it's just a fact of life. We only complain about something that we can change. So how do you really get into this abundant life? Well, I noticed the pattern of Jesus because he's our model. Come on. He was, a, he was a man that lived a supernatural life and showed it it's possible for you and me. How did he do it? Number one, he made a decision. Not I'm going to try. Now let's see. He made a decision. Don't let your feelings counsel you Monday morning tomorrow to let you know what kind of day you're going to have. 
sure as heaven don't look at CNN and Fox to determine the quality of your life. In fact, tune them both out because they're both lying to you. Make a decision that you're going to enjoy your day and not let their stuff get in your soul. Jesus is building a kingdom, not a natural government. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I, but I'm a Republican. I am a Democrat. You're going to listen to both of those news things, and they're going to make you mad and angry at the other person. Why? Because all of their power is built on polarization. And I just talked to the president's son just a couple weeks ago. Watch for a minute. Watch. You got to make a decision. I'm going to enjoy my life, life and death, blessing, cursing. Please choose life. Paul the Apostle, Acts chapter 20. Who's more worthy, who's more capable of writing to us? Being prisoned, stoned three times, having the skin ripped off his back, 39 lashes like Jesus, minus one, three different times. Seven hours stoning, they dropped stones from the top of your head to the bottom of his feet. He was resurrected from the dead, living in a prison. He goes, everywhere I go, they're going to stone me, they're going to lie about me, they're going to beat me up. But I said something, none of this is going to move me because I'm going to finish my destiny and I'm going to finish it with joy. I'm not going to do it tore up, I'm not going to do it with a bad attitude. I'm going to finish this thing with some joy. I'm going to do it with energy. I'm going to do it with passion. Yeah, there's funky people. Yeah, you got some funky relatives. Come on, everyone's got a funky uncle. Comes around once a year. But I'm going to do it with joy. Imagine how different your atmosphere of your home is going to be. If you say, you know what, some Monday morning, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice on purpose. Business might be slow, but you're the God that's going to make a way. I might not be feeling my optimum, but you're the God that restores health to my body. I might not be enjoying as much, but I'm going to find new things to enjoy. My boss and I might see my value yet, but I'm going to think, how can I make something better today and improve people where I go today? As for me, don't let your feelings decide what kind of day you're going to have. In fact, let me say this. I said this on a TV show not long ago. You're never what you feel. You're always what you decide. Can I just say that again? It's a tweetable moment. It's a, say, it's a saying that saved my life. When people stabbed me in the back, they twisted the knife. When I was hurting like hell. Rex, you're not what you feel. You're what you decide. Think about it. You can feel happy, angry, elated, horny, all in about 30 seconds. You only laugh because I said horny. Come on, somebody. Someone did something for you to get here. Come on, somebody. You just didn't pop out. (laughs) Just because you feel it, you don't have to be it. Culture wants to tell you your feelings. You feel like a woman and you're this. That must mean that you're this. If you feel like an animal, you're an animal. If you feel like you're the carpet, you're the carpet. If you feel like you're a freaking goat, you're a freaking goat. How many know that does not change who you are? The designer made you an original. Don't die a copy. Someone say, I'm an original. Come on, somebody. Slap the person next to you. Say, I'm an original. Someone say, don't die a copy. Watch. Second, you joy when you get thankful and full of gratefulness. Watch. Every miracle Jesus did, whether raising Lazarus from dead, multiplying food, when he would come to a place, thank you, Father. He never asked God to do a miracle. What if I challenge you for seven days, don't ask God for anything? Well, brother, the word says, ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. (laughs) Brother, you have not because you ask not. Yeah, it does say that, and I believe 100% of it. But what if you take a vacation from all your anxiety trying to pray and convince God to go big? He's big without you trying to convince him. Faith is not convincing God to go big. Faith is joining God in a life that's bigger than the one you got. Yeah, that is so good. Think about this. What if we shifted all your anxiety? Come on. To anticipation. How do you do it? Psalm 67, 5 says, as they gave thanks and praise, then the Lord released increase. Wow. Oh, it is said after they begged and after they tried to plead, God, you can do it. Wow. You know how many people come to me? Lord, I know you can heal me. Wow. They're like trying to convince God to be a healer. He was healed. He was the healer before there was a sickness. 
I know you can provide $2,100 for rent. Really? When he spoke the world into being, come on, he put diamonds in Sierra Leone rocks. He put oil in the ground. Come on, somebody. In the middle of Iraq. Come on, somebody. He put onyx stones in the middle of the river Euphrates right outside of Baghdad. And you're trying to convince him for $2,100? What if you did this? Thank God for who he is. Who is he? He's your healer. Come on, somebody. He's your victory. Come on, somebody. He's a dream giver. He's a restorer. He's a peace giver. He can quiet any storm. He can restore a relationship. He can restore a marriage. Then you thank him for what he's done. I don't know your personal history log, but sometimes it's nice to see how far he's brought you. Come on. You couldn't shy your shoes on your own power this morning. You might have had the desire, but the power to pull it off came from him. There's a lot you could be grateful for. In fact, if you wrote a, got a piece of paper and put a line down the middle and wrote everything you got in a week versus everything you gave in a week, you will realize you got a lot more than you gave. And everyone in this room has a lot to be grateful for. Six million people, excuse me, one million people died in the last six days. You're still here. Somebody needs something you got. That's the only reason why you're still here. Ooh, that makes you highly powerful. Touch the person next to you. You're a miracle waiting to happen. See, this ain't just all about you. Don't let the devil isolate you in your head. Come on, don't let your mind play tricks on you. Dun, 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 dun. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs what you contain. In fact, if you recognize it, you'll recognize your value and live rewarded for it. Let me just park here for a minute. If you'll recognize what makes you angry, you'll fe- will recognize what you're called to correct and change. Anger's fuel. Most people don't study. I am angry. Something's wrong. No, misplaced anger will get you into a bad place. But when you're angry, you can change things on the planet. When you get angry enough, because we all get what we tolerate. If you can tolerate not taking care of your health, you'll get more of it. You can tolerate a relationship that's like Ricky and Lucy are in separate beds. Come on, somebody. And conversation strain, you'll get more of it. But when you get angry, say, never again. I'm not going back to that addiction. I'll do whatever I got to do to live free. I'm not going back to being a pervert. I'm going to be free. I'm not going to go back to living broke because broke is not a circumstance. It's a mindset. You with me? If you have a roof over your head and you're top 24% of the people on the whole entire planet, If you have 15 American dollars to your name, you're in the top 12% of the richest people in the world. I've been in the middle of Africa where someone takes me into their hut, and it's made of dung. And they're so proud of it. And I've also been in a 46,000 square foot home with a multi-billionaire, and he brings me into his home. And there's 50-foot ceilings. i got butlers and everybody else cooking for me. And he sits down and goes, what do I do with my life? My life sucks. And this woman brings me into her home, her little thicket home in the middle of Tanzania. She's got thicket around it because they had to build it so the elephants and the lions don't get in. That's her security guard. Come on, somebody. And she don't got on any dollars. Come on, have nothing. She's got a dung home. And when you walk in and she shows you her little 15-inch, her little thing in the ground where she goes pee and where she also makes food. And she's so proud. Come sit in my living room. And it's a little box. And she sits down. I have so much to give God grateful for. Look at how much I got in my hand. Perspective. Come on. Watch. And do you know how much while you can just increase the, the quality of your life and just be really enjoying your life because the joy of the Lord is your strength? Just by smiling. Yeah, yes. that's right. You want to throw off your whole community and family? You want to trip people out at Starbucks? Walk around and smile. Try it for five minutes three times a day. You'll reduce your cortisol. It stores your fat. You will actually speed up your metabolism just by smiling five times, three times a day. I did this on CNN. This is a true story. Do you know over 52 times in the scripture, God references the way people hold their face? God would not put that in the word of God if he didn't care. Why is your face so sad? Why do you look so gloomy? Why don't you lift up your eyes and lift up your face and you'll become radiant? If you look to me, you become radiant. If you look at circumstances, you become depressed. God wants to know what thing on your face. You're a billboard for him. Most people, my wife and I have done it before. We walked in a moment and go, let's just throw people off. <laughs> Walk up, let's just smile. <laughs> people go, are you okay? Can I get you something? Are you okay? What's wrong? It's amazing they think something's wrong when you're in a good mood. I was on the Delta flight not too long ago, and the lady goes, who are you? I go, oh, my gosh, do you feel my energy? She goes, oh, my gosh, I do. 
She's like, why are you so happy? I go, oh my gosh, I got this energy in me. She goes, there's like something magnetic about you. I go, oh my gosh, tell me more. And she goes, do you mind if I'm done serving? Can I just come sit next to you? I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a place right here. So I did, I played it off, totally played it off. I acted like totally new age and everything. I was like, oh my gosh, yes. She came by and she goes, what's this energy? Why is this energy trying to make me cry? I go, because it's not just an energy, it's a person. He's the one that created energy. His name's Jesus. He said he, he, he can change your ashes into beauty. He did it for a guy, Rex, the guy that's talking to you. I've talked to over millions and millions of people. I know what it's like to get off a stage and almost run my car off a cliff because I wanted to end my life because I'm suffering. Wow. Wow. This isn't a cute little hip-hop message. I'm not trying to be popular. I care about people. I care about your soul. I care about how you engage in your life. I care that you have a comeback, not just setback after setback. I care that you live up to what's great inside you. Your greatness will not go on sale. There's no discounts when it comes to destiny. I know what it's like to sit there and go, you know what? I'm going to live this life. I'm going to enjoy this life. I'm going to smile when it hurts like hell. Why? Because man might be watching, but God's watching. Come on. That's right. yes. But that doesn't seem like it's super spiritual. I should be confessing 10 t- uh, scriptures all day long. Yeah, you could confess them and be in a bad mood and nothing happens. You can smile and be in a good mood and you're a billboard. You just draw people to you. People walk to me all the time, and I take no credit for it other than I've learned it out of the Bible, and I decided to apply it to my life, that I decide to be in a good mood. People are like, why are you so happy, cuz? Don't you got stuff going on? Sure do, cuz. Come on, somebody. I've had four hours sleep in three days and spoke my freaking guts out. Why are you in a good mood, cuz? <laughs> Today's the day I'm only going to live it. If I'm going to live it, I'm going to live it with all my heart to you. Not partially, not halfway. If you say I'm too old, then oldness, more oldness is coming your way. I'm tired, more tiredness is coming your way. I'm tore up, more tore up struggles coming your way. Come on, somebody. The Bible says, let the weak say that I'm strong. I got eight minutes. Watch, it's going to be good. Come on, you're gonna, it's going to be a blockbuster ending. Watch, I didn't even get through the story. Watch. Jesus shows up. This is place is known for its miracle activity. But these waters never produced miracles or supernatural reactions until they were divinely stirred. Most of us are waiting for somebody else to stir us instead of stirring ourselves up ourselves. What about the dreamer inside you? Is it stirred or stagnant? If the dreamer inside you could talk, what would the dreamer say? Would the dreamer inside you say it's been hard watching you settle for less and less in life? Working jobs beneath your talent, letting other people decide and define your roles. Has the dreamer been put on the shelf and rocked to sleep because of disappointment? Now you become addicted to a life without dreams. But the dreamer inside of you and me could talk. Remember, there's power in your dreams. Without a vision and a dream, you perish. Helen Keller said, what's, what's worse than being born blind? Having sight with no dream or no vision. Why? Because without a dream, you're a slave to your surroundings. Sight's the function of your eyes, but vision's a function of your heart. God gave you the gift of vision so you don't got to live controlled by what you currently see. What do you mean? When Jesus was being nailed to a cross, he didn't talk about the cross. He talked about when he's going to rise. You can tell when someone's got a vision and a dream because they talk about what they're going to and not what they're going through. If I walked into your crib, your house, are there more pictures that show me where you've been or where you're going? Your atmosphere matters because what you look at affects your mood. It affects your decisions. Come on. You need to make your atmosphere worthy of where you're going. Someone needs to become a dreamer again. God pulled Abraham out of a tent and said, I know you're rich. I know you got it together. I know you're ready to watch Jerusalem idol and make love to your wife, Sarah, because she's pretty, the Bible said. But I need you to come outside and count the stars. They believe, astronomers believe there were 60,000 stars across that Milky Way in the middle of Mesopotamia desert. And Abraham lying on his back in manure and dirt, counting stars. Why? Because God made him a promise. But it wasn't enough for him to have it in his head. He had to conceive 
it in his heart. You conceive it when you get a vision of where you're going and the person you're going to be and what you're going to give. Do you want to know why I love C3? I know it's a lot of energy. You want to love this church? Well, I genuinely love it. No fabrication. I don't need another job. I don't need another speaking engagement. I got enough. You want to know why I come? Because when I'm around your pastors, when I become your leaders, I dream bigger. I learn things that go beyond my intellect. When our worship team is worshiping this morning, I'm experiencing Acts 16. It says something that when you begin to worship and begin to praise God, you learn things that go beyond your intellect. I don't know about you. My mind can only go so far. I believe in disciplining my mind, training my mind, renewing my mind by the living word of God. But there's things my head rejects that my spirit demands. Joseph had a dream. Come on, Stu Middleman ran 1,000 miles in 11 days, not one blister. He had a dream. Walt Disney wanted to build a world. He had a dream. 302 people told him, your dream sucks. He still believed in his dream. Stevie Wonder, he asked his mother at five years or six years of age, why am I born blind? True story. She said, because you're cursed by God. True story. He goes, oh, mama, we ain't cursed by God. Come on, everyone do the Stevie Wonder, even if you're white. Try it. Look at that. Ah, that was good. Look at the white people. They did good. You're like, aren't you white? No, I identify as salmon. Come on, somebody. A couple days after this experience for Stevie, he's at his mother's, his friend's house next door, Billy, and they're in the barn. And they're in the barn, and he trips, he hits a rock, and he shows to put his hands out to try to stumble just to grasp whatever he can. And when he does, he stumbles into this thing, and it's a broken piano. True story. Never touched a piano since I was seven years old. He hits this and sounds goes off and he starts screaming, I can see, I can see, I can see. Billy got nervous and ran out. Wow. Stevie Wonder ran home. Part of me wants to wonder how the blind kid ran home. <laughs> Running into stuff. He runs home and goes, Mama, Mama, we ain't cursed no more. She goes, what are you talking about, Steve? What are you talking about, Steve? He says, what are you talking about, Willis? What are you talking about, Stevie? He goes, Mama, Mama, we ain't cursed no more. I was at Billy's and I stumbled and I hit this thing and there's sounds. Mommy, I see all the people. I'm going to make all the people. They're all smiling when I make the sounds. Mom, I'm going to make sounds. No, 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 you can't see. You can't see my, my skin. You can't see my, no, 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 Mama, I don't see with my outer eyes. I see with my inner eyes. I'm going to make people happy. He mastered 11 instruments in the next seven years. He's made over $700 million. His mama was happy he saw with his inner eyes. Yes. Amen. Ken Norton, who knocked out Muhammad Ali, broke his jaw in half. He came to see me before he passed in heaven. I go, he goes, Ken, Rex Crane, you fire me up. I go, come on, Ken. He goes, you're a brother. You know that, right? I go, yeah, I feel you. I go, but tell me, how in the world did you knock out Muhammad Ali? How'd you crack his jaw in half? Rex Crane, I grew up Poe. I was Poe on the, on the inside, but I had power on the outside, but it did do me no good. I had to learn to see myself, so I started reading the miracles of God, and I brainwashed myself on miracles. I read miracles. I'm doing what you told me, right? I'm putting a miracle mentality inside me, not a good mentality, not a positive mentality, a miracle mentality. I got to see myself the way God says I am. I got to see it. If you're, Rex Crane, you got to see it if you're going to be it. Seven times in the scripture, God comes to people and goes, what do you see? Not naturally, but what do you see with your spiritual eyes? Wow. Heaven wants to know what you see. Yeah. I walked away from professional baseball because a 76-year-old woman on an airplane sat there and said, you're going to change millions of people's lives and destinies. I go, bless your heart. You got the wrong dude. Wow. Come on. It's amazing when God gives you your invitation, you usually give him your limitation. Yeah. Your assessment is not worthy of his assignment. Wow, but she would write me letters every week, don't quit, millions are in the delivery room. Don't quit, you're going to heal people. Don't quit. Come on, this little woman, nobody knows her name. She's in heaven today. Her name's Louise Hicks. I had one woman in my corner, and I wouldn't want Roger Clemens or Jose Canseco or any other guys to see me cry. Because when their words would hit, it would hit your soul. When I'm talking today, this isn't just bouncing off your head. I'm talking to your freaking soul. Some things are deeper than your logic. Come on. I'm grateful that you have some knowledge. I work with a lot of powerful, wise people in their heads, but their soul is what carries everything. You have a heart before you have a soul. Come on. Watch. 
What about the lever inside you? Is it stagnant or stirred? Have you put walls up between you and love? Now you're in your relationships. What can you done for me lately? Do you evaluate it by that? Do you evaluate by what you're getting or what you're giving? Is your expectation so high that your appreciation is so low and you wonder why your relationships are flatlining? Because a lover inside you has gone silent and listless. I'm grateful for the dreamer in every one of us. But the lover is the most important part of you. Because love gives and lust takes. Love gives and lust takes. Come on, somebody. Love gives and lust takes. I don't want to be known for what I made. I want to be known for what I donated. I don't want to be known for what I took on this planet, for what I contributed. I don't want to be known for what just, I want to do. Hey, as far as for me, I'm going to love. Yeah, you're going to take some cheap shots. You're going to take some cheap shots, but I want to love. What's life without love? What's life without love? Come on. They asked, that, they asked the trainer of secretariat, the horse that won all those championships that was undersized, how it won so many things. They found it has such great stamina and strength. The one denominator they found was its heart was four times larger. Imagine if people at C3 East, our hearts got expanded to love three, four times larger. Imagine the love, the miracles, the power, the salvations, what we can achieve. Come on, stand and watch. Love gives, but it also forgives. Why do you say that? Because 61% of cancer patients right now, according to the Mayo Clinic, as of last week, have unforgiveness issues. Wow. Unforgiveness is now a medical-defined disease where people hold on to the hurt rather than release it against themselves and other people. So now Dr. Stephen Stansfield has created forgiveness therapy, and it's a class for cancer people. Because the cortisol rises, holding on to so many toxic emotions. And I end with this story today. I took a different route than I wanted to end with, but this, God's in this thing. Watch. There's a woman in South Africa before apartheid, and Dr. Officer Vanderbrook, a white officer with two other officers, showed up at the house, and they took their black son out, and right in front of the mom and the dad, they killed him for the color of the skin, and they called him all kinds of bigot, bigot names and just evil names, and they killed him and blew his brains away. They were so poor, they tried to get, I don't know if it was in Soweto, South Africa, what part of South Africa, it was in Durban, but they went to try to go get help, and they turned a deaf ear to them because of the color of their skin. Two years after a documented story, they showed back up, the officers, same ones, took off the father and blew him away or they, they took him away the wife did not know where she went for a year and a half she tried to find out where he was nothing happened finally finally they came back for her and said we want to bring you somewhere the officers brought her out and there her husband was tied to a big old long piece of log and wood out by a lake and they poured gasoline over him and they lit him on fire and they danced around calling him names for the color of his skin See, if the enemy can defeat you in your mind over what you see and what you've experienced, he'll defeat you in your experience. She tried to get vindication, nothing happened. Years, a couple years passed, and finally, they actually prosecuted and convicted Officer Vanderbrock. And in the reconciliation of South Africa, what they do is they let the person that was the victim be able to talk about what kind of judgment they believe that person deserves. This woman, she stood up. She didn't have any money, very little not nice clothing. She was real poor. She'd taken a bus to get there, and she filled in with all kinds of people, both black and white people. And they said, what do you, what do you, what do you recommend? She says, Judge, I need three things. Number one, I need someone to take me to where my husband, his life ended because I want to get his ashes, and whatever's left there, I want to give him a proper burial. Because, Judge, we did not have much, but my husband was great because he was a lover, and he made me feel special. That even though we didn't have a lot to live on, we had a lot to live for, and I want to give him a proper burial. The judge said, absolutely. Number two, Officer Branderbrock, I want to tell you today, sir, you caused me a lot of harm, but today I want to tell you that today you've forgiven. And I'm telling you this, sir, because I'm letting you off my hook. You're not off God's hook, but you're off my hook. And the reason I'm forgiving you is I don't have much. I don't have an education. I don't have money. I don't have anything. But one thing I know how to do is I can love. And I don't want you to be able to steal and kill that and destroy that part of me because if I don't love, then I don't live. I, I, today, I choose to forgive you. Today, I choose to release you. Today, I want you to know that you're forgiven as if it never happened. And I want you to know that, Judge, I'm going to live because I'm going to love. Everyone began to cry. No, whole room. 
Third, can somebody please help me over to him because I don't want him to hear it and let it be a nice little thought. I want him to feel the love. They helped this little 76-year-old woman across with her cane. She went to hug him and he passed out. All of us crossed the room in the middle of so much political unrest and apartheid before Nelson Mandela. These black people grabbed the hands of white people. White people grabbed the hands of black people. No longer dominated by anything else. And they began to sing across that room, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, now I see. One, moon, one woman, it only takes one. One star can guide a ship. One song can change a moment. One vote can change a nation. Watch how powerful. One woman who chose to forgive and release and decided to love again became the tremors that changed a whole entire nation. Don't underestimate the power of your love and your touch. I know what it's like to go put my hands on children's bodies that are eradicated, just defecated with AIDS. I know what it's like to touch. There's nowhere you feel more alive than when you're loving and you're living. And every one of us, as Paul said, let our love abound more and more. Jesus said, by this, they'll all know that you're my followers. If you show love, not if you talk love. Come on, somebody. I don't need nobody to talk a great game. I need someone to play a great game. We're going to put ourselves on the line for people. Come on, we're going to heal people because we care. How many, how many are ready to make a move? Come on. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, team, and what we do at C3 San Diego, go to C3SanDiego.com.